front. Uh, and also, I would point out that we do have some seats up in the front in case that uh, it's only standing room only in the back. Uh, I'm Matt Killian. Uh, I'm the president of the Red Lakes Chamber of Commerce, BNL. Uh, Chamber is also in Foss Lake and, and Pequot Lakes as well. We're very proud to partner uh, with the Minnesota Chamber and the Republican Party of Minnesota to bring the 2018 governor's race uh, right here in the Brenner Lakes area. There's a number of groups. Am I fitting in and out? Can you hear me? What's that? There we go. There's a number of groups here I want to thank for welcome this afternoon. And first and foremost, I want to thank the Republican candidates from my left. I want to say thank you for being here. Um, thank you for sending the message that business, jobs, and the economy is an important issue. We all know that. But also, thank you for uh, sending the message that the Brandon Lakes area is an important region of the state. And so if you could please join me in, in thanking and welcoming our, our candidates. recognize our uh, local legislators, state legislators that are in the room, and we have uh, Senator Kerry Root, We are very excited. 
excited to partner with the Brainerd Lakes Chamber of Commerce and the Minnesota Chamber to bring our Republican candidates for the 2018 governor's election to a very important and diverse part of the state. As Matt mentioned, my name is Jennifer Carnahan. I'm the newly elected chairwoman for the Republican Party of Minnesota. I'm also a fellow business owner in the Greater Lakes area with two stores in this one. And previously, I did serve with Matt Killian and some others on the Government Relations Committee with the Greater Chamber. At the Republican Party of Minnesota, our mission is to elect Republicans at all levels of government, local, state, and federal. We do that through recruiting talent into our party, fighting for our party's platform, and working to expand our base and our message. One very important pillar of our party's platform relevant to today's forum is promoting economic prosperity. We believe economic prosperity is driven by individuals, not government, and thus we work to champion candidates and legislation that will lower the tax burden, exercise spending restraint, and create and maintain a competitive business environment to allow businesses and families to grow. The focus of today's forum is the 2018 governor's race, and this race is of critical importance to the state of Minnesota. From the Republican perspective, it is imperative that we elect a Republican governor so that we can commence swift work on a common, common sense conservative agenda and turn back the tide of eight years of DFL mismanagement. We want to see taxes lowered for business owners and individuals. We want to stop the progressive agenda, which is mandating excessive minimum wage increases in our metropolitan centers. We want to see investments made in our roads and bridges across Minnesota versus a mass transit system in the Twin Cities. But most importantly, we want to see our families thrive and grow in Minnesota. Today, we have six of our Republican candidates running for governor. Before I get into introductions, let me briefly explain to you how our process works. Each of our candidates is working hard across the state of Minnesota right now to earn the endorsement from the Republican Party of Minnesota to be the name that you will see on the ballot next November in the general election as the Republican candidate for governor. On June 1st and 2nd, our party will hold a state endorsing convention in Duluth. There, approximately 2,200 Republicans from all over the state will come together to vote for who our candidate for Republican governor should be. The voting is considered complete when one of these individuals receives a majority of 50% plus one. So when you receive your general election ballot next November, the name you will see on the ballot comes through this process. If you are a Republican in this room today and are interested in becoming one of those 2,200 individuals that gets to select which one of these candidates will be the Republican candidate for governor, you can get involved at your local level. Since we're up here in Crow Wing and Cass County, Crow Wing County gets 37 spots out of those 2,200 to vote next June, and Cass County gets 17. If you're interested in running to be one of those delegates, you will just need to attend the Crow Wing County Convention or the Cass County Convention, which will be held at some point in February or March of this upcoming year. Just stand up, give a one minute speech on why you want to represent and get to have a vote next June and select your endorsed candidate is. Before I get into introducing today's candidates, I want to acknowledge a few others who are in the room today. We have Jim Neuberger, who is a Republican candidate running for U.S. Senate. Jim, where are you? We also have Doug Wardlow, who is running for Attorney General on the Republican Party. And I think we have two individuals running for Congress. Down in Southern Minnesota in Congressional District 1, we have Jim Hagnor. Congressional District 7, which is Western Minnesota, Tim Miller. I'd also like to acknowledge Lance Johnson. He is a Republican candidate running for governor. There were some timing issues, so he's not able to participate in the forum today. But for those of you who will be at our convention tomorrow at Craigens, Lance will be there. He will be giving a speech, and he will look forward to meeting and speaking with you all. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our incredible I'd like to start out by just saying it takes an incredible amount of 
work to run for a statewide office, and in this case, governor. These individuals on the stage are driving all over the state, speaking to groups, championing their message, and they do so so that they can give us a choice at the polls in November. I'm grateful to each and every one of them for being here today. Let me start off with Matt Dean. Born on the Iron Range and raised on Rice Street, Matt and fellow Rice Streeter Dr. Laura Dean are raising the sixth generation of Minnesota proud deans. Matt started his own business after graduating from the University of Minnesota Architecture School. Matt has proudly served in the Minnesota State Legislature in the House. He served as Chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, Majority Leader, and he is a happy warrior for common sense conservatives in Minnesota. Matt Dean. Next, we have Keith Downey. A business leader, political reformer, and strong family man, Keith Downey entered politics because he saw how corrupt and broken the system is. He beat an 18-year incumbent Republican, was a reformer in the state legislature, then rebuilt the Minnesota GOP. Keith is our former state party chairman. Keith knows where the problems are with the will and skill to fix it. Keith will work to make Minnesota work for everyone. Keith Downey. <laughs> Mary Giuliani Stevens. Mary Giuliani Stevens is the mayor of Woodbury and a graduate of the University of Michigan and the William Mitchell College of Law. Previously, Mary was a partner in the law firm of Moore, Costello, and Hart and has also worked as an arbitrator and mediator. As mayor of Minnesota's ninth largest city, Mary has executive experience balancing budgets, proposing policy, and effectively running government. Welcome, Mary. <laughs> Jeff Johnson. Jeff was born and raised in Detroit Lakes and lives in Plymouth with his wife and sons. Jeff is currently serving his final term as a Hennepin County Commissioner. Hennepin County is one of the largest counties in the country and Jeff is one of seven commissioners who oversee a nearly $2 billion annual budget. As the most conservative voice on the board, he is sometimes in a minority of one and is always engaged in the fight for fiscal sanity and responsibility, increased government accountability, and requiring that the county programs actually produce measurable results. Welcome, Jeff. David Osmond. David is a Minnesota State Senator representing Senate District 33 since 2013. David is the Chairman of the Senate Energy and Utilities Policy and Finance Committee. He served on the Mound City Council from 2001 to 2013. David is married to his wife Carrie and has two daughters. David and his family are members of Our Lady of Lake Catholic Church in Mound and he is also a proud graduate of St. Cloud State University. Welcome, Senator Osmond. <laughs> Philip Parrish, a K-12 music teacher and licensed principal, Philip joined the U.S. Navy Reserve as an intelligence specialist in 1998. Philip holds a Master of Science degree in Educational Leadership and a special, Specialist degree in Educational Administration. Now a lieutenant commander, Philip has served as an intelligence officer for 19 years. Married to Victoria, Philip has six children and two granddaughters. Welcome, Philip. <laughs> we appreciate you all being here, and I will turn it over to Bill Blazer to moderate today's forum. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, first, let me also say thank you to everybody here today. Uh, it's testament to the strengths of this community and its businesses and its local chambers that everybody would come out on a Friday afternoon and hear what these six candidates have to say. So I appreciate your presence. And frankly, seeing you here is one of the things that makes uh, working for the State Chamber of Commerce, a uh, great job, so thank you for being here. The State Chamber has been thinking about and trying to work on um, helping our state elect the best possible governor for the last uh, 12 months. 
Uh, we've conducted a series of conversations with businesses around the state. And if you look on your, on your table, appropriately, you'll see a big poster, uh, or not a big poster, you'll see a big picture of, of, uh, of your friend uh, Paul Bunyan. Look on the back. Uh, the back is the, is the result of our conversations around the state. If you will, it's our effort to present a job description for our future governor. And I think it's a great thing to look at before you hear the responses of candidates to our questions, because at least it gives you maybe a, a, a measuring stick against which to consider their, their responses to our questions. So here's the way we're going to proceed. First, we're going to have each candidate give an opening comment, uh, 90 seconds. Then we've got four prepared questions, one on workforce, one on uh, taxes, one on health care, and one on um, uh, labor management relations. We're going to ask those four questions. Then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. We're going to limit the length of responses to the four questions and to the audience questions go so one minute. And um, our timekeeper, Nate, Nate, raise your hand. He's the most important guy in the room. <laughs> and um, we're going to uh, enforce Nate's uh, uh, time decisions um, without exception. Everybody got that? Yeah. Um, so, because actually, frankly, the um, the more direct and to the point responses, the more time we've got to ask questions and learn about your views. Uh, you'll also see on the table a card. And um, that card is for you to write down your questions for the candidates. Around the room, there are members of the Brainerd Lakes Area Chamber. Raise your hands. Um, they're going to circulate around and try to collect these cards, but given the number of people in the room. If you can pass cards to either wall, it'll facilitate um, their ability to pick up the cards. So uh, we're going to get started in a second here, but maybe one more point. Um, this is actually the first of two debates that the Brainerd Lakes Area Chamber is planning. Obviously, today we have the Republican candidates. Brainerd's Lakes Area Chamber and the State Chamber has been in contact with the uh, state DFL party, and our plan is to have a similar event for the state, for the DFL candidates for governors. Again, our mission is to let you understand and help you understand the views of folks who want to lead our state. And so today we're going to hear what the Republicans have to say. Early next year, we'll do a similar event for the DFL candidates. Okay, um, to get us started. I'm going to ask each of the candidates to give us an opening statement. And frankly, you can talk about whatever you want. Um, our focus here today, though, is business issues and the economy. So I suggest you try to focus on that. But during the week, I told people that I met with that I was coming up here to moderate uh, this discussion. And to a person, they all said to me, ask them how they would go. Ask them what their experience is and track record is governing and, most importantly, believe it or not, leading a compromise. Dealing with a contentious issue, resolving it, and resolving it in a way that actually becomes actionable. So, like I said, you can use the 90 seconds however you want. But, again, our focus is the economy, and I think there are a lot of folks, not just here, but around the state, who really are interested in how you can have your job and, um, and then your ability to make a deal, if you will. So uh, we'll start with Representative Dean, we'll go across and then we'll change it up as we go. You have 90 seconds. Well, thank you, Bill. Thanks to the Chamber and thanks to all of you who made the trip all the way up here to Brainerd. Uh, it's going to be a great weekend. We really appreciate it. And to the business owners out there, thank you for signing the fronts of paychecks. And we've got lots of guests up here who are going to help you make your payroll because we're going to fill out our shopping list for Christmas. So we're going to do that for you, and we are thrilled to be here. So thank you for having us. My name is Matt Dean. I was born on the Iron Range. I grew up on the east side of St. Paul. I'm running for governor. I've been
got some experience with health care in the legislature, with finding some compromise, but I want you to think about the Capitol Dome and think about the golden horses that are out in front. That's to symbolize the prosperity <coughs> of this state. And leading that chariot is two women, one representing agriculture and one representing industry. That's leading the prosperity of our state. When we built that capital 100 years ago, that's where all our prosperity came from. Today, that's where it comes from, too. We need a governor that understands that and doesn't have to choose between clean water and prosperity and clean water and a good economy. We need a good economy. We need a robust economy. We need a governor that understands that and shares the values of the state of Minnesota. I do. I can't wait to get to work as your governor. My name is Matt Dean. Thank you for having us here today. Look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you too, and congratulations on a great event. My name is Keith Downey, uh, running for governor as well. And I'm running for a really crystal clear but difficult purpose, and that is to make Minnesota work for everyone. And right now, if we're honest with ourselves, it's not. You go into downtown Minneapolis and there are families that just want a safe school where their kids can graduate. You get up here and you talk to a small business owner and they're suffering under stifling regulations and taxes. You go by the Iron Range and people just want the mines and the pipelines approved in a safe, uh, environmentally friendly way. You get out onto the farms and all they want is the MPCA and the DNR to get off their back and let them do the thing they always have in Minnesota. And people have this sense around this state that government is coming at them, not from them anymore. We're starting to lose really good people, farms, businesses, capital, wealth. They're leaving our state, and we have a chance to turn it around, and this is the election year to do it. My message to the people of Minnesota is clear. I believe in you. I believe in the people in this room, and I trust Minnesotans, not bigger government for our future. That's what will guide me. We're going to be really strong on this campaign. And we're going to go out across this entire state and pitch a message that we know will work, that we can cut taxes and regulation and reinvigorate the private economy, that we can shrink the size of government, make it smaller, cheaper, better, that we can fix the schools that are literally failing so many kids. We can turn this state around. We can do this. And the question about how do you lead, when you have the people with you, Leadership and negotiation and compromise is so much easier. So we're going to be bold. We're going to go out and tell people we can make this state great again. Thank you. I'm going to stay seated. If it's hard to get up and down, this is pretty tall. Um, anyway, thank you to the Greater Lakes Chamber uh, for hosting this, the Minnesota Chamber and the Republican Party. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Mary Giuliani Stevens. I'm the mayor of Woodbury. Um, I've been married to my husband, Greg, 33 years. Woodbury, if you don't know, is an East Metro uh, community close to the Wisconsin border. We're the ninth largest city in Minnesota with about 70,000 people. Um, I, I have prepared remarks because I'm new to this, but I'm going to diverge a little just because of what Bill said. He said, you guys are business people and you care. So what I'm here to say, as the mayor of Woodbury, I have executive experience, balancing budgets, proposing policy, working with local businesses. I am honored and privileged that the Woodbury Area Chamber of Commerce allows me to serve on their board, and I have done so for seven years. We work together to look at what the issues are, to find trends for businesses, and come up with solutions. We have done it successfully in our community for seven years. The chamber has grown, our businesses have grown. So a little bit about me, I was first elected to the Woodbury City Council in 06, ran for mayor in 2010, then ran unopposed um, and I'm serving my second term as mayor. I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. My dad, uh, we went there when I was probably three years old. He was a physician at the Mayo Clinic. I went to Mayo High School, went to the University of Michigan for school, came back to go to night school at William Mitchell College of Law and worked during the day. After law school, um, yes, I'm done, thank you. <laughs> Come and learn about me, but I wanted to talk about the business part, so thank you. Bill, none of us follow rules very well, you know, you can learn that over the next hour or so. 
I'm Jeff Johnson. I am running for governor as well. I was born and raised in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. My wife, Sonny, is from Kirkston. I should add, um, I used to be the favorite son of Minnesota until Adam Thielen screwed it all up. I mean, so they ain't good. Um, I uh, have spent most of my adult life in the private sector, the last 16 years as uh, being a self-employed person in the business area. I've also served during that time in the Minnesota House for six years, and now for the last nine or so years, I've been on the Hennepin County Board, as Jennifer said, as the often lonely voice, I would argue, of sanity in the heart of Minneapolis, and I'm running for governor. And I'm running for a really simple reason, to take power away from government and to give it back to the people of Minnesota. And I look forward over the next uh, hour or so to explain some of the policy ways we're gonna do that, but I will just boil it down to this. We're gonna change the attitude, the culture in government from that of, of controlling and directing and punishing people and businesses to actually serving the people and the entrepreneurs who pay our salaries. And if there's a government employee who can't buy into that, who can't get on board with that, they're not going to survive the Johnson administration because people don't exist to fund government. Government exists to serve people. And that will be what I wake up thinking about every single day as your governor. Thank you all for being here. I look forward to the next hour. Well, good afternoon. My name is Senator Dave Osnick. I come originally from Glencoe, Minnesota. I serve District 33, which is the western side of Hennepin County, which you probably recognize more as Lake Minnetonka area. Very good area. When you do the tax incident study, we find out why I live in a good area. We're also known as the piggy bank, because every time we raise taxes, and you look at the tax incident study, it goes ping, 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 dead red right in my district, because I have one of the, one of the highest per capita districts in the entire state. Uh, and also, I'd like to say thank you to MnDOT for finally getting all those damn yellow or orange cones off of 371. Uh, I grew up in Glencoe, but in 1975, my parents bought for $15,000 on Lake Pelican a lot. And we have had that in the family since 1975. So it's great not to have to lead and dodge all the way up 371. Uh, I want to actually answer the question because sometimes we don't answer questions up here. Compromise isn't necessarily a bad word. I will agree to that. I was one of the leaders in getting bipartisan support of repealing the Sunday sales law in the state of Minnesota in the last session. That was very bipartisan. There are some senators that are in the room that didn't agree with me, but we did get it through. But I will say this, Bill. There are times where there is not going to be compromise because we as a party have compromised too much, too often, too soon. When I say we're getting rid of the Metropolitan Council, for those of you who are here in, in Brainerd, you don't know what they are, but they are an unelected, unaccountable bunch of socialists that are running the metropolitan area. <laughs> Well, he said, I, one more thing. No, 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 no. Can't you compromise? No. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Philip Parrish. I've got 90 seconds. Check out Philip Parrish at uh, parrishformn.com. P-A-R-R-I-S-H. The number four, mn.com. I hope to see you tonight with our Cregans. Make sure you come to the social and learn more and more. 90 seconds, what can we talk about? A, I'm not a politician. I'm a teacher. I'm a principal. I'm an intelligence officer. You've trained me through because I'm essentially your employee to be a really sophisticated investigator. How am I going to handle being a governor? I'm going to investigate things. I'm going to find out where the waste, fraud, and abuse is. I've been involved in several waste, fraud, and abuse cases, and I can tell you I can find it. And we're going to cut the budget by getting some rid of that waste, fraud, and abuse. The other thing that I noticed in your question is negotiation. As an intelligence officer and as a principal, a principal at a school that dealt with uh, human, uh, human services, corrections, uh, all the different agencies that we have involved with children, we had to make some really hard decisions involving several different agencies, pushing and pulling. And you can imagine as an intelligence officer, now lieutenant commander, growing up through the ranks, I had a lot of really, really serious commanders who I had to try and have a opposing, uh, you know, opposing views and opposing interests that uh, didn't always jive. And I had to come up with a way to help that commanding officer actually make a good decision 
and make the right decision to help people. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate everybody's applause after each candidate, but that slows us down. So I know we want to be polite Minnesotans, but let's hold all of our applause from now on until the very end of the discussion and then applaud, give a standing ovation if you want. But let's get going here. So the first question is going to be about uh, workforce issues. The biggest challenge facing Minnesota businesses is finding uh, qualified workers. Our state demographer tells us that this is going to be the case for the, at least the next decade. How would the state help to solve this problem under your leadership as governor? And uh, why don't we start with uh, Philip, and we'll come back this way, and it's a one-minute answer. All right, we're going to have a safe time. We're going to not stand up every time as well. Well, you know, there's some conflicting information here. You know how many universities and education that the settings are in, in this state? A lot of really good ones, right? Now, why is it demographic demographer cannot find well-educated, well-trained people? Is it focus that's wrong? Are they training in the wrong area? Are they not paying attention to the needs of the community? So these are questions that all of us have to start asking and engaging. What on earth is going on here? Do you know the millions of dollars we're spending, sometimes daily, in education, and you're telling me a demographer can't find workers? I had a great conversation, which I'm going to run out of time real quick, earlier uh, regarding workers and not being able to find workers and not being able to get to the locals. I just want to offer one anecdote. Several years ago, and as a Navy officer, and he enlisted as well, I didn't hesitate moving six months a year, have to do a job, and do it with a, with a joyful heart, and make sure my family was okay, and sure we missed each other, no. but there's more to do. Senator Ross. Well, when it comes to the education system, the reason we're not finding educated uh, people for jobs is because we're, we're making people, kids, feel like failures because they, if they don't go to a four-year university, we just stigmatize them that they're not getting a good education. We have great educational opportunities for in our community colleges and technical institutions that can actually give them better jobs in, in many cases than you would be at a four-year university. Uh, we also have to start... Uh, getting kids to understand that going into a hard work field such as a welder or a sheet rocker, going into trades, they actually will pay to train you, train you and actually provide you a better job than you might get coming out of the university, being a, a uh, multicultural university professor of whatever. You know, we have lots of different fields that you can go into, and we shouldn't pension folk kids and prepare them to go into just a single pigeonhole area, we have to train them and give them better jobs through technical schools. And I think that's one of the solutions is to focus more on those, those schools. So a big part of this is just a training deficit, I think, and government certainly can play, I think, a more active role in making sure colleges and technical schools are working with business leaders to make sure our kids are getting the skills they need to succeed. But I agree with Dave. There's something much bigger going on here, and it is this philosophy that if a kid doesn't go get a four-year degree, they are somehow not successful, or they're somehow a failure. I see that all the time, and I think that's so sad. And I think that a governor should be using the bully pulpit to advocate for technical training, for trade schools, and for apprenticeship programs. And we should be so proud of these kids who make that choice. Because they're not doing what society tells them they have to do. They're doing what's right for them. And they're serving a real need in the state of Minnesota right now. We should be celebrating these kids. And I will as governor. Thank you. A good workforce is an educated workforce. We have to put our kids first. And that means providing options. And I agree. And one of those options has to be good technical training. And that starts in high school. We also have to continue to leverage our, our partnerships. And Greater Minnesota is a perfect example where the business community is partnering with the K through 12 and the two-year colleges to provide pathways for our young, our young people to get good job, good paying jobs in an economy that then provides those jobs with little or no college debt. In fact, the Brainerd Area Chamber has a program going on, and I, I wrote it down, it's the Bridges Workplace Connection doing exactly that thing here in this community, providing outcome-based and value-based education. Keep up the good work in that. 
We also have to really close that achievement gap. And I think that means bold leadership. If schools aren't performing, change the operators of the Thank school. You, Thank you. Well, for me, uh, workforce and training issues, uh, while important, are a symptom of a broader problem. We have the public sector crowding, and crowding out the private sector in Minnesota. We are a net out migration state. We lose more native Minnesotans to other states than move here from other states. That is a deficit that is caused by the economic policies of the Democrats and the Dayton administration. We change that and we make Minnesota an attractive place to do business, to move a family and grow a family, and we reverse the fundamental trend that is causing the problem. And I'm gonna second uh, what Mary just said. We have a cancer in this state, in the urban core largely, but other places too, and it's the education achievement gap. Literally 50% of the kids that started in Minneapolis public schools in September in ninth grade aren't gonna graduate. And if you're a minority, it's 75% of those kids. That is an absolute outrage, and we need to change it. We cannot be leaving that many thousands of kids behind in this state and expect that we're going to have a healthy workforce. Thank you. This past week, I just finished traveling around the state to 87 counties in 87 days. And I talked to lots and lots and lots of employers. And I was asked to say, what's, what's your number one issue? And it's either health care and workforce or workforce and health care over and over and over and over from one end of the state to the other and they're up against it and they're competing but they're not just as keith said they're not just competing against other businesses we don't have a zero percent unemployment they're competing with the government that has a payment structure that pays people not to work they're also competing with people who are here illegally and that's a problem because it deflates wages for everyone else and it causes competition and it's unfair competition for people who live here and for people who were born here and for people who follow the rules. And Obamacare is the third one. There's so many rules that say, if I get a promotion, if I get the next job, if I get this job, I will lose my health care at home. I will lose a benefit at home. We can't have businesses Man. competing with the government for Man. workers. We're gonna go to health care right now. <coughs> Uh, okay, so if you have questions for, for the panel, write them down and, uh, like I said, pass them to either side and the chamber reps will pick them up and uh, we're going to get ready to start asking here in just a couple minutes. So, uh, let, uh, next question is on health care and we'll start with uh, Keith Downey and go down the row and then uh, Representative Dean will be last on this one. Uh, in order to attract and retain talent, many companies offer employee benefit packages that include health insurance. As Congress wrestles with how to fix the Affordable Care Act, how can Minnesota make health insurance more affordable for businesses and those who buy individual coverage? Well, the short answer is to get government out of health care uh, as much as we possibly can. Uh, those employer groups that you mentioned are actually pretty healthy and well-funded plans with decent coverage at a decent price for their employees. It is the other side of the equation where government runs all of these health insurance plans uh, for people in the state that's the real problem. And so yes, we need to repeal um, insure, but not just the website and not just the call center, all of the penalties and the mandates and the regulations. And my proposal for a healthy Minnesota, my healthy Minnesota plan, pushes the one million people, believe it or not, one million people get their insurance from the state of Minnesota to provide them a voucher to go out in the private market to buy the plan and the coverage that fits them with the benefits that they want at a price that's priced for them. We will substantially reduce costs. The goal is to reduce the cost 25 to 50% while maintaining Minnesota's historically low uninsured rate. We can do it if we get the government out of the way. Well, Obamacare just set us back. Minnesota had one of the best health care systems. Um, unfortunately, we can't repeal Obamacare as governors, uh, but I would work with the administration to get the reform done, which isn't happening up there now. And, you know, we don't have simple answers. So I thought about this. We, I haven't had to do with health care at the local level, but I thought hard and long about it. And I decided there's some core principles that I would look at as governor in redesigning the system. And the first being that the individual has to be the primary decision maker in their health care. You know, I grew up in Rochester, I understand that. 
Secondly, our finance system and our delivery system has to encourage that relationship. Thirdly, we have to make sure that we maintain competition between our healthcare providers and our healthcare uh, payors. And finally, the overriding principle has to be that as public policymakers, we have got to encourage innovation in healthcare because that's what's going to give our care quality and that's what's going to drive our costs down the best we can drive them down. Thank you. So three simple principles on this. Uh, number one, Minnesota knows better than the federal government what we need to do with our health care, and so they will either give us some freedom, although I'm not convinced of that, or we're going to demand freedom through a third, Section 1332 waiver from the ACA. Number two, the more competition between providers and insurers, the better. Uh, so, for example, I'm not convinced that the federal government is going to be able to figure out how to let individuals buy across state lines. We can do that regionally. We can, we can find an interstate compact with Wisconsin and Iowa and the Dakotas so at least our citizens can have more choices and more competition. And then most importantly, number three, is to give individuals control of their own health care and health insurance decisions. So that means starting to eliminate the mandates in the state. We have more, I believe, than any other state in the country. If somebody believes that a catastrophic policy works better for them and their family, then government is in no position to tell them that they're wrong. Uh, and it all goes back to just more freedom and more choices for people. Well, a great president once said government is the problem. That is the problem, is that every time government touches health care, it blows up. Now the new idea from our friends at the Democratic Party is to create Medicare for all. That's the, one of the biggest disasters upcoming of all time. It's just not a Trojan horse. It's a Trojan horse filled with Alcantara. Uh, one thing that we need to do, is, from a government perspective, is reduce the number of mandates that we have. We mandate all kinds of things into insurance policies. We have to allow insurance policies to be flexible to meet the needs of the individual. Second, I'm going to pull it out. I'm not allowed to use props on the Senate floor. But this is my health care savings account. And we should be encouraging 20-somethings and 30-somethings to get into these programs because these are transportable. I deposit almost $5,000 a year plus the amount of money, including the amount of money that my employer puts into it, that I use to pay for everything that's health care related. And then there's a high deductible insurance policy that backs it up. In the last legislative session, we did one other thing. We introduced uh, the allowable uh, to allow individual or for, for insurance for and profit insurance companies for a market in Minnesota. So that's one last thing. All right. So we need a to get government off our backs. B. We need to make sure that you can form associations and pools to be able to diversify and diffuse the cost from all the those in the pool. I've seen some really interesting trends since we've been out on the campaign trail. Some really interesting associations and pools that have developed and have permission to develop. Could you imagine if those pools, and then across the state lines, could develop those pools so they're large enough to actually cope with diversifying the cost and diffusing the cost? Here, here's a, the common sense thing that we have to talk about. None of us want people to be out in the cold, not being able to take care of, and especially catastrophic stuff, have to cope with on their own. Nobody wants that. But we have an issue with the fact that we have payers and planners, we have non-payers and non-planners. We have predictable costs and unpredictable costs. And how is anybody going to make any of this work with any initiative until you get some of the basic principles down on paper and start coping with the reality that you have to deal with the real math, the truth on the ground about what the needs no, are and no. how to pay for them. Thank you. P.J. O'Rourke said, if you think health care is expensive now, just wait until it's free. <laughs> That's what the Democrats are going to be offering. One of us is going to be chosen as a Republican candidate. It's going to be going up against somebody who's going to be offering free health care. They're going to be offering Santa care. They're going to say, you pay more and more to get less and less. You see other people pay less and less to get more and more. It's not fair. We're going to give it to you for free, and we're going to make it fair again. Now, you need to choose a candidate who can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that and say, we're going to take care of the people of the state of Minnesota who really need help, and we're going to offer care to people who can afford to purchase it the Minnesota way again. We figured it out a long time before Obamacare screwed it up. We met every metric of Obamacare in the country. We had the highest quality of any state in the country, some of the lowest costs. 
We could have, we had a plan for people who had pre-existing conditions, plan for people to stay on their parents' program until 25. We met everything and they screwed it up. We need a plan that survives Obamacare. I've got it. Good. Thank you. And, okay, let's go to taxes. I think it's safe to assume that all six candidates would support tax cuts. If I'm wrong, speak up right now. <laughs> so the question that we have is, what would be your highest tax cut priority? And after you cut taxes, how would you make sure that Minnesota businesses have the high quality public services that they need in order to still be competitive and be successful. So we, as much as we want tax cuts, we also need the infrastructure. How would you get there? Let's start with, uh, with the mayor and we'll go that way. So uh, Keith, you'll be last and stuff. Mayor? Thank you. I do think the top priority should be to get Minnesota out of the top 10 in all of our tax brackets. And the other thing that I've learned as mayor is that our business community needs consistency and certainty. So let me just give you Woodbury as an example. We've grown jobs in Woodbury by 17%. We've added over 270 new businesses. We've had 2,800 new homes in the community, built in the community. I go out personally. I meet with developers. I meet with small businesses. I meet with corporations. And I hear the same thing from them all the time. We, we like and we need the consistency and the certainty. And that's what we're missing in this administration. And we need that there. With respect to your second part, in terms of the infrastructure, um, and I don't know if that's a separate question, um, but that's what I would do there. On the, on the services, yes, government provides core services, but you have to provide them efficiently and effectively. We are not doing that. Minlars, you look at that, that is a total disaster. I'm going to do the second half first. With respect to services, I, I believe that every single program that government funds in Minnesota should be audited for outcomes. And that will take years, but I will start that as governor. And then the taxes, I could give you a long list, but if I had to pick one to start with, it would be the income tax, which for many of you is just a pass-through pass business tax. The top income tax uh, rate in Minnesota is 85% higher than the national average, which is a big problem because wealth and investment are leaving the state. But the bigger problem I have is the bottom rate. Our lowest rate is higher than the highest rate in 22 states. Think about that. The people least able to pay, by definition, are paying a higher rate than the richest people in nearly half the country. We are not taxing to death the CEO in Minnesota. We're taxing to death the school teacher and the bartender and every struggling small business owner in this state. So that would be my top priority. Well, I'll start off. Uh, there's three points I'd like to make. Start off with one. My first initiative as governor will be what I call five for five. We are going to reduce spending, not the rate of growth, reduce the actual spending, because we have plenty of programs to cut in this state that are completely useless. Reduce spending in the state by 5%. And raise your hand if you'd like to see the sales tax in Minnesota drop from 6.875 down to 5%. Plenty of people in this room. Why? It helps everybody here. It helps everybody at the top of the food chain or the food scale or every place. It, it, the earners at the top, it helps everybody all the way down to the bottom. It is completely neutral. Now, the other thing we have to do is begin reducing and streamlining rules and regulations. Businesses, time is money for businesses. We have to end all the hoops that they have to jump through and all the paperwork they have to do. Last thing is, we have to focus on reducing the cost of energy in Minnesota because that is a hidden tax. Every, every second of electricity that comes out of these lights is getting more and more expensive. We have businesses moving out of the state because we used to have good, cheap energy. We don't have yeah. more. Thank you. Thank you. So income tax, number one. Number two, start making sure that infrastructure helps everyone it is not actually picking and picking winners and losers uh, for you. Businesses, it's hard work. It's hard working out there developing businesses. It's hard work getting out there developing communities. But those people that are local to the community, local to the businesses, they have the right answers at that time. The government steps in and starts making decisions for picking winners and losers. It causes all kinds of problems. So income tax, make sure that the infrastructure is fair and, and uh, helps everyone. And then also make sure that we stabilize, stabilize the uh, stabilize 
And the predictability, I love the predictability. Your first one is talk about predictability in the six months we've been doing this. The predictability, can you imagine? Can you imagine what could happen if a business knows what's gonna happen for six months, a year, two years, five years, and they don't? We all know we're gonna pay taxes, but we can't predict anything because every time we turn around, there's another scheme. Yeah. Actually, the most important thing about addressing taxes in the state of Minnesota is not addressing taxes in the state of Minnesota, it's actually addressing spending. Spending in Minnesota actually drives the cost of taxes and it drives up our, our tax base. So you can't get at that. And as much as I'd love to see progress in Washington, D.C. right now on a tax bill, I wish they would have done Obamacare first. That's a tougher job. You've got to tackle the spending first, otherwise you're just trading loopholes and, and favors. We need to address spending in the state of Minnesota. I've cut it out of one bill over a billion dollars and passed it off the floor. $230 million was spent over six months paying for insurance and welfare for people who live in another state, who don't qualify because they make too much, or who are dead. In the state of Minnesota, we need to get after spending and we need to do it immediately. At our borders, all you need to do is go to South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, drive across the border, and you will see prosperity changes. You will see regulatory changes. So we need to tackle spending, we need to tackle regulation, that will help. Yeah. Well, everyone talks about cutting taxes, and that is exactly right. You can do it at a state level without cutting spending because we have to balance our budget. I'm actually the only person up here who has actually cut spending 50% at the state party and reduced our debt uh, by 63%. In contrast, the state of Minnesota, when I left there, it was $35 billion biennial budget. Five years later, it's $46 billion. The Health and Human Services spending just went up 15% this past year. Our overall budget, almost 10%. Hennepin County's gone up 53%. It's the 21st biggest employer in the state of Minnesota. So if we want to get at taxes, we have to get at spending. I actually have a plan, the plan that I released five years ago, to reduce state spending 15% in my first term. If we do that, that is literally a $7 billion tax cut. We can get rid of the estate tax, the corporate income tax, across the board, income tax, pass-through income tax. We can get rid of the statewide commercial uh, and industrial property tax. Get rid of the $2 billion tax that the Democrats passed six years ago and pay for an infrastructure program that I have proposed. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to our fourth and final question. Again, if you have questions, so write them on the cards, pass them to either side of the room, and we'll get them up here and try to answer as many of them as we possibly can. So finally, I want to ask you about um, uh, what we call uniform labor standards. Uh, thanks to our friends, or I shouldn't say my friends, because I live in Minneapolis, um, and St. Paul, we are in Minnesota creating, or starting to create, a patchwork of, of regulations related to things like paid parental leave, paid family leave, and minimum wage. What we'd like uh, your comments on is what you think the appropriate role of local governments is with respect to labor management relations and then how you would implement your views if you're elected governor. And believe it or not, we're going to start with the mayor. And go. It's twice in a row. Oh, I'm sorry, mayor. No, 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 I apologize. That's my mistake. So let me just preface this by saying that I generally don't believe it's the proper role of state government to stop local government from doing stupid things. And seriously, just think about how busy we'd be just with Minneapolis at that point. <laughs> so, so, so in general, I'm not a big fan of these preemption type of bills. Unless you can show that what is being preempted would have a significant negative effect on the state economy as a whole. And so you have, frankly, pointed out one of the very few examples where I would support a preemption bill, which is creating some sort of patchwork of either minimum wages around the state or required benefits around the state. That would definitely have a negative impact on the economy, and I would support that. And uh, I can tell you, as a, a longtime employment and labor lawyer, this is something that's pretty dear to my heart. Well, my initial thought about a year ago was if Minneapolis wants to screw themselves into the ground, why should I stop and sit back <laughs> and do anything about it? Let them do it. Now St. Paul wants to do it. I mean, they want to become festering 
cesspools of socialism, why should I get them in the way? <laughs> Except that when you have businesses that do a small amount of work, let's say it's a landscaping company, and they go over to Tony Lake of the Isles, and mow somebody's grass, and if they do that a couple of times a week or once a week, or they just plow some snow, suddenly they're going to hit the trigger to actually do some of this stuff and actually have to pay workers the $15 an hour and give them all those benefits. So then it does exceed their authority, their ordinance exceeds the authority of their, of their line, of their city. That's where I saw the light finally realize, this isn't local control. What we are doing by stopping them, and I would, I would sign preemption the minute it got to my desk, what we would be doing is protecting the local control of the other cities who didn't approve this and didn't want to shut down the throats of their businesses. Can I finish sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I may have misunderstood the question, but I think the focus is a bit different. The, fact, the bottom line is, in my view, and I believe in our platform view, is that the government needs to get off your backs and let you do your job. And there's a lot of beautiful, creative, work, really hard working people out there who run some really fantastic businesses. The government doesn't belong in your business. You're decent, kind, and generous people. To assume that we need the local government or the fe state government or the federal government to step in and start making you treat your employees correctly. There's a wonderful thing my dad taught me a long time ago. People generally want to meet expectations. And if you expect everybody to be stupid, cruel monsters, I guarantee you most of the people are going to be stupid, cruel monsters. I guarantee you that 99% of the people in this room, you're not stupid, cruel monsters. You're doing the right thing for your people. You're doing the right thing for your business. You're doing the right thing for your community. And we need to get the heck out of your way and leave you alone. Yeah. Well, first of all, these preemption uh, legislation at the city level doesn't have anything to do with hours of work you work a week or how much money you make an hour. It has to do with raw political power. That's what it's about. The liberals have figured out that they can't win at the governor level in many, many states that only got 34, 34 Republican governors. So they moved down to the legislatures and they found that they've lost legislative chamber after legislative chamber after legislative chamber. So now they're moving down to the cities and counties where they find big blue cities like Minneapolis and they say, we can enact change and we can do union legislation that we can push through and we can do uh, hourly rate legislation that we can push through and we can jam it through and we can get laws through from all this national money that can come into these cities and we can grow our way up from the cities rather than impose it from the governor level down or from the state legislator down. That's what's going on. Thank you. Well, I may be the outlier here. Um, I just want people to realize that if the state government uh, takes this preemption, what else can they take preemption on? And will we not actually have established that it is the purview of state government to define the work rules and the payroll of every uh, business in this state? And so you open up a can of worms that I'm not sure you can put the lid back on. And so I'm not quite as, uh, I wouldn't describe it quite as harshly as Senator Osmick, uh, but if Minneapolis wants to advance down this path, and we see the exit from Minneapolis of businesses and hardworking people, and other communities realize that, and they take advantage of that by having the reverse in their communities. Now we have a competition in Minnesota that breeds success and it breeds health. Because when you empower state government to do that on this particular preemption issue, watch out. And guess what? Where does everybody come to get their will done in Minnesota? City Hall? No, state government. Everything gets big. Big government, big labor, big finance, big legal. You can't compete unless you compete at the state level. I think it's a mistake. Mayor. I signed the preemption law. I talk to businesses every day, and as I said earlier, they want consistency, they want certainty, and they want a level playing field. This is what moves our economy, this is what creates jobs. And I just learned yesterday, sorry Minnesota Chamber, you lost your case. Um, I, I learned yesterday they lost their case um, against Minneapolis on the minimum wage. And so as governor, I would work with the legislature and we would address this. We need to do it. Our businesses need consistency. They need that level playing field and they need constraint. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to go to questions uh, that, you, that you've submitted.
And uh, same format, we'll give each of our candidates a minute to respond to each of these, and uh, we will do as many as uh, time allows. The uh, first one, one of you, somebody in the audience, uh, observes, and I think it's accurate, that all six candidates are from the Twin Cities. No. Except no. Philip? Okay, so five of the six. And you can answer this one anyway. So they want to know, what do, you, what do you bring to greater Minnesota, and how will you represent us? And we'll start with Senator Ross and then move down the line. Well, just because I live up by Lake Minnetonka doesn't necessarily mean I'm not a country woman. Uh, I was born in Glencoe, spent my first 18 years on a farm where we've had uh, animals and eventually we loaned out the farmers to shovel the door out of uh, heroin crates and dairy barns. So I know a lot about the door and believe me, the governor has plenty of the door stored in that uh, governor's office right now. We've got to clean up. So what do we have to do in rural Minnesota? It really is about jobs and having a reduction, lowering the sales tax is an incredible boon to all businesses in Minnesota. That's the first thing you would do. Second is work on roads and bridges because they need to get product to market. They don't have the ability to put their products onto the light rail system because we know how much product that that can carry. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that we can do, but don't think that I'm not a country kid at heart. That's not the first 18 years there. Wow, so much to talk about. You know, I've been around the world in uh, several countries and in Minnesota here, I, I've been in third world countries where I get better internet access, better communications access, better communications in general in third world countries than I do in parts of Minnesota. Isn't that sad? So how about we start with we treat the entire state fairly and equally? How about our school districts get treated fairly where every student is funded at the same rate? How about we treat our students with respect to the fact that it doesn't matter what part of the state from, every single district is dealing with diverse students from every part of the world. Why are we coming up with schemes to help one over another and picking winners and losers from the governor's office or from the legislative office? It's just plain wrong. The bottom line is, everyone needs to be treated with respect. I've been born and raised in southern Minnesota. I grew up on a farm. I became a teacher. I'm a, yes, I'm an intelligence officer and I've been around the world, but I've seen a lot of great things and I've seen a lot of terrible things in my life. And it's only made me have a good perspective. Representative Dean. Thanks, Bill. Our next governor needs to be the governor of the whole state. And when we run for governor, we need to run to be the governor of the entire state. And that doesn't mean pitting the urban areas against greater Minnesota or vice versa. We need one Minnesota because we're going to have to have an economy that pulls together as an entire state. Greater Minnesota has great fundamental issues that they need addressed. And I hear that every day when I'm out on the road talking to people, talking to county commissioners, talking to business owners. The needs are different. The specific needs are different. We have to pay close attention to that. Governors can really address that. Lieutenant governors often balance that ticket. That's one way you can do it. Who you appoint within the agencies is extremely important, whether it's the DNR or the DOT or the MPCA. When you're a farmer, when you're a small business owner, when you're in greater Minnesota, it makes a big difference who the governor is and who they appoint. Believe me, we need a governor from the state of Minnesota, from our party, that can address the whole state. Thank you. Well, a handful of uh, individual things, some of which I already mentioned, uh, approve the mines and pipelines, uh, undo the buffer law and ditch mowing, uh, or buffer provision and ditch mowing uh, policy, um, reduce taxes so that we can offer property tax relief on the commercial and industrial side, which helps the entire state. But I think the biggest thing is that our governor needs to have an abundance mentality, not a scarcity mentality. People get pitted against each other when we're not growing and we're not healthy. I'm telling you, we reinvigorate our private economy. We go around this state in this campaign as Republicans and tell people, we believe in you and we're gonna re-empower you in the private sector to grow. Good things will happen. We will have growth, we will have opportunity. That is the platform from which to lead the entire state. The reality is the Democrats had complete control in St. Paul six years ago and they jammed greater Minnesota. The reality is Republicans have exploited that. We got our majorities back in the House and the Senate and by exploiting the fact that they had done that. This election cycle is the time when we can have a governor who rises above all of that, he pulls us together in a growth mentality, and we can do it. You know what I've learned? We all want the same thing. We want to live in communities that are safe. 
in our persons and property. We want good schools. We want good jobs. And so I, I think a governor, I, no matter what city they come from, can govern with the idea that we want that for all of our communities. All of our communities need access. We know we need access. We need it for education, and we need it to be competitive here and abroad. So as governor, I would govern for the whole state of Minnesota to make all of our communities great places to live and work and thrive. So there is really, if I were honest about it, there's a great distrust out there. And it's not just the two regions. It's not just the Twin Cities versus greater Minnesota. It's urban versus suburban versus greater Minnesota. And there's the, the distrust that I see really bothers me. And honestly, I'm the only candidate from either party right now who has the balance to address that. And I think the trust from all three, because my wife and I both spend essentially the first half of our lives in greater Minnesota, in northern Minnesota. We live in Plymouth. And I am in the heart of Minneapolis every single week trying to solve some of the most difficult problems that are facing the urban core. And if we actually want a governor who can bring these three <coughs> segments together, you need someone who is trusted by all three and who understands and actually respects the lifestyles in all three. And I think I'm uniquely qualified for that. Good. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a few of you had questions related to education. So uh, here are two of them. The theme is pretty common. Let's get your uh, comments and uh, we'll start with, uh, with Philip Parrish. Uh, what is your position on funding education in Minnesota, pre-K through, through high school and higher ed? So they want to know how you fund the whole system. And then secondly, how as a governor do you fix our failing schools? You can pick one or the other or you can try both. Wow. <laughs> um, bottom line, all of our students, is, let's start at pre-K to 12. All of our students need to be treated fairly. All of our students deserve the same treatment across the state. These schemes about coming up with, uh, you know, what school district, if, I mean, read the most recent formula directives with regards to how to fund a school. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm a school law, uh, I, I specialize in school law and school finance, and I've read the most current one, and I'm telling you what, it's darn near impossible to figure out where the heck you're gonna end up in the district, and, and I'm gonna have to stop real quick, but <coughs> treat all of our students the same. They all are deserving, and stop funding um, set higher education to the tune of billions of dollars that are wasted on infrastructure and people that never touch a, a, a student's life. The first thing that the governor of the state of Minnesota should do is really look at the relationship between the federal government and the state government. What are we being told that we have to do that doesn't get paid for? Well, it's quite a bit. And I can tell you that the unfunded mandates from the federal government in the area of education and health care are not surprisingly our two biggest costs in the state of Minnesota. And we need to start protecting our state again from federal mandates, number one. Number two, I don't know if any of you saw it, but uh, Thinking Minnesota from the uh, Center for the American Experiment has done a great job of exposing the stuff going on in the Edina school districts that doesn't have very much to do with reading, writing, or arithmetic. Our kids are bombarded with non-curriculum stuff that comes home in backpacks that has more to do with politics and social reengineering than it does to do with civics, math, or science. We need to understand that and get control back over our curriculum, get it back to students, uh, to their parents, and to their school boards, and to take it away from the social engineers. Yeah. Well, it's a personal one for me. My dad is a teacher, and I grew up raised by a bunch of teachers' families. And I look at what's happening uh, with the teachers' union and the fact that it's just a bargaining unit. Uh, I look at what's happening in these schools in the urban core that are literally failing their kids. And this education bureaucratic system is immovable. And so I think kind of principle number one is we need to increase choice. If you are the parent of a child in a school that is literally failing, you need to get a voucher to be able to go to the school of your choice. The second thing is to cut ourselves off from that federal funding stream. Short-term pain, long-term gain. And then the last thing is we have to have a governor who is not afraid to take on education Minnesota. 
I am sorry, but they are a significant barrier across so many places. I look at my dad's once proud tradition and I look what's happening uh, to them. Now not only are they simply in it for the money and to protect their franchise, but they're actually an agent for this propagation, this left-wing propaganda into our schools. It's really sad. We're gonna have to have a governor who is strong. We have to care about all these kids. Thank you. Mayor. I think there's a lot we can do. More options, I said earlier. We've got to get this regulation into the 21st century. Our school districts are not independent school districts. They don't have choices. I talked to the three that, that uh, are over Woodbury, and there's so many formulas, they have no creativity in doing that. We need a pipeline that recruits and, and rewards great teachers. We need a no-nonsense governor that is going to look at that problem in our, on our inner cities and that achievement gap and address it by requiring performance, and if there's not performance, you know, there's lots of innovative ways to change that and, and either get new operators or I have some other ideas that I'm exploring and I will share as well. But these are all things that we can do to make education better for all of our students in Minnesota. So this comes down to a big principle. It's more, more than just about K-12 education, but I'll relate it to that. Every decision we make about K-12 education should be about what's best for the kid. Not what's best for the school, not what's best for the teachers or for the union or anything else. I hear this all the time. When I talk about school choice, what's the response? What's going to happen to the school? And the answer is no. What's going to happen to the kid? And what's best for each kid? And so to me, somebody asked me the other day, if you could wave a magic wand and do any really difficult thing in this state, I said the one thing I would do, or the first thing I would do, is I would make every penny follow the child. Rather than funding institutions, we would fund kids. And if the parents thought the best thing for that kid was to send them to their public school, that's fantastic. If it's a private school, just as fantastic. If it's homeschool, just as good. It's not government's role to make that decision. Of course, I understand that that is waving a magic wand, and we probably have to start by dealing with the, the schools that are truly failing our kids, because it's really hard for liberals to argue against that one. Well, my answer is going to focus on hard issues, not philosophy. In K-12, uh, we have things called school districts. They have election certificates just like most of the people that are here on the dais. They should be empowered to be incubators of change. Uh, but what happens at the state of Minnesota is we in St. Paul think we know better than everybody else. So we start making rules. Prime example is the bullying law of 2014, I believe it was. Every school district already had laws in place, but then the state of Minnesota, in their infinite wisdom through their legislature and their own headed governor, came up with their own brilliant idea for what you have to have for a bully law. We didn't need it, we don't need it. Now second, on higher education, at the University of Minnesota in particular, we need to start focusing on Minnesota kids. We do not need to encourage and import kids from out of state. We need to be a land-grant university, which is what we were set up for. But we are focusing far too much on importing kids from other states and from other nations as opposed to making sure that we have the opportunities for our kids that are here in Minnesota. There should be some diversity, but we should be focusing on our kids first. Thank you. Great. Okay, let's. Um, it wouldn't be, a, I think, a complete discussion here in the Brainerd Lakes area without a question about lakes and water. So, a few of you asked a question that I, um, that I think is captured this way: uh, What restraints do you consider appropriate in order to keep public water safe for recreation, fishing, and drinking water, especially related to agriculture? So. Thinking about our 10,000 plus lakes, what would you do to keep them safe for recreation, fishing, and drinking? And let's start with Matt Dean. Well, Governor Dayton approaches it this way. He says, we can't have good farmland and clean water. We have to have one or the other. I, think, I just completely disagree. I think farmers are the best stewards of the land. I talked to a farmer out in western Minnesota, fourth generation farmer. He said the number one rule that he learned from his grandpa was you leave the land better than you found it. Farmers take good care of their land, and we shouldn't make lawbreakers out of them and expect them to do bad things. We should expect good things and make sure that that happens. We need to have policies that say you can actually take a fish, a walleye. Middle class family can go to Black Lake and get a couple walleyes. We can do that. You know what? We can do that again. 
we actually don't have to have a management policy that says that middle class people can't go and catch a fish in a lake and eat it anymore. A walleye and a soda, for goodness sakes. So we can actually do these things and have both. We do not have to pick and choose between clean water. Thank you. Keep down. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I grew up here. I bet you everybody in this room shares the traditional Minnesota conservation ethic, right? We all care about the water. Where's Minnesota going to be if we have bad water? And so I think there is a balance to the way uh, that we approach it. And a heavy-handed, top-down, uh, DNR, MPCA, knows best mentality that imposes all these rules and programs on people who care far more than they do is absolutely the wrong approach. There is probably a role for us to measure for that buffer rule implementation, for example. Instead of telling everybody exactly what to do, why don't we just measure the water at the bottom of those screens and let the local communities figure out what to do based on the information that they have. We've got lake associations. We have local board of uh, water and uh, soil. We've got all kinds of local organizations in this state uh, to do the right thing. We can trust Minnesotans. We can trust Minnesotans to do the right thing on this. We don't need a governor telling everybody what to do. Yeah. We all want clean water. Um, I think with respect to the buffer that they've been talking about, I have no idea where the science was on that. I, I really do think the governor woke up one chance at 50 feet. Um, you know, I, I do. I don't, you know, if there's science behind it, show it to us. I know as a mayor of a community, water is one of the biggest things we push back on. I carry around a little chart that's got every federal, state, local, voucher, every agency in water. Um, that over-regulates every aspect of our water, whether it's storm water, whether it's aquifer water, um, without science or good policy behind it. And all that does is increase time and money for businesses and people and communities. Because as, as a mayor of a community, when those regulations come down to my community with no dollars with them, guess where it ends up? On the taxpayer's back on property taxes. It's unacceptable. We need e enormous amounts of streamlining in our regulation regarding water. So this really goes back to what I talked about at the very beginning and what I talk about everywhere I go, and that is the arrogance we're seeing from state agencies. The DNR is the best example, but it's not the only example. Uh, and I've been traveling around the state a lot and meeting with a lot of hunting groups, meeting with a lot of anglers all over greater Minnesota, and the frustration is great. And it, it goes to this really simple concept if the DNR or any other state agency is going to make significant decisions about our lakes and streams or anything else, they should include the people it affects in the decision-making process, rather than shielding all the information so they can't even figure out what is behind some of these really controversial decisions. That's about serving the people rather than directing and controlling the people, and this is just a perfect example of that. Well, at the, end of the, at the end of the 2015 session, Senator Weber worked very hard into the wee hours of the morning trying to get a buffer law in place. He had the administration there. And what happened? His Imperial Highness, Mark Dayton I, walked away from it because he knew he had the rulemaking authority within his agencies to go right over the top of the legislature and put in what he thought was the law. And we all know one size doesn't fit all. What everybody has to understand, I think most people don't, is that we have watershed districts across every square inch of this state. They are empowered to do exactly what the governor was talking about. The second part is, is I am sick and tired of demonizing farmers for what they do. When are we going to start talking about Minneapolis and St. Paul and the street discharge that they come off their street, their sewers wet or their, their street uh, runoff every single time it rains? You should see what happens to the Mississippi, but Mark Dayton likes to pick winners and losers. Who does he pick? He picks his whip favorites in Minneapolis and St. Paul to never touch, never implement any kind of water quality against. But boy, we're going to go get those farmers. Under my administration, we're going to treat everybody equal, and those buffer laws are going to be repealed for a common sense legislative solution. So we hear a lot of the same, uh, the same information here, and, and I don't disagree. <coughs> But one of the things I've really tried to focus on when I'm out visiting with farmers and, and local communities in within the cities and within small cities, give people some respect and some dignity. We've got a lot of really, here again, a lot of really decent, hardworking people out there. What on earth? I mean, stop being nice about it. Walk up to your liberal friends or your one world order globalist nutcases and walk up to them and look them in the face and say, listen, what makes 
that you think a farmer or a miner wants to destroy the earth or the water? What on earth makes you think that that's even a viable discussion? They don't want to destroy what, what makes their living. They don't want to destroy what takes care of their children. It's just ridiculous. Are there people that exploit the land and do terrible things? You bet there are, and we immediately figure out who they are, and we immediately hold them accountable. But stop treating people like monsters. Okay. Um, we have three questions left. I've got one on taxes, uh, one on mining, and then one on governing. And I'd like to get to all of them, so I'm going to cut the time to 30 seconds. Because that's a statewide issue, and I think folks would like to know, um, mining is a long, has long been an industry in Minnesota. What is your position on mining? And we're going to start with Keith, I think, and go right down the road. So we get a 30 seconds. We can approve the mines and pipelines and do it in an environmentally responsible way. Minnesota is one of the very few states that has their own environmental review law on top of the federal environmental review review law and a mine can actually get through that entire approval gauntlet and still be locked down in, in legal uh, challenges. So uh, we've got to position our state for success. We can approve those mines and those pipelines and we can do it responsibly. We've been providing safe mining and pipelines forever in Minnesota. We have to continue to provide the jobs and understand that people will be responsible. With respect to the pipeline, they want to replace it. I mean, this is, isn't that what you do as things are failing? You replace them. I don't know where they're coming from on that one. But mining provides good jobs and miners protect the environment. So I, I totally support that. Yeah, amen. I'm guessing you're going to hear the same thing in 30 seconds from all of us. But uh, when you look at what's going on on the, what's going on on the Iron Range, it is, it is one of the areas that needs good jobs more than anywhere else in the entire upper Midwest. And we have the opportunity to do that in an environmentally safe way. So we ought to be moving forward with it. And then the pipelines is just insane. Because instead of running oil through newer pipelines, we're going to be running it on trains, which is much more dangerous. It's, it's absolutely crazy. So move forward with both. Well, I'm probably the only one up here that has a legislative record on this particular issue, right? Because it never came out of committee. We stopped every time they wanted to stop twin metals and the uh, and polyvent, but we stopped it in the dust in committee. Uh, I'm absolutely in favor of that. We have the toughest water quality standards in the entire world, not just the nation, the world. And if we can't do it here, we can't do it anywhere. And also, we gotta tell the environmentalists, you know, a byproduct of copper mining is actually a chemical that you need in battery power. So if you want to have more electric cars, you should be protecting and encouraging copper mining. Okay. So, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're going to hear a lot of the same things, so a little different twist. I want as many people as possible today, if you have social media uh, accounts, Twitter especially, you connect up with the people, the good people up in northern Minnesota, and you start reading up and tweeting and retweeting and posting and reposting their stuff. The biggest problem we got going on is not just a, a legislative thing at the moment, it's not just a governor at the moment thing. We have agencies and, and a let, this entire government has been subverting uh, laws and rules and regulations that have been on the books for years that do a good job just the way they work and how they are. Thank you. Kathy. A few months ago, Phil and I were in Virginia, Minnesota, and we heard from many folks from the city who want to save the North and the other region. One woman said that her daughter was making over $70,000 a year in the mine. She's got two little granddaughters. Lost that job, now has a $19,000 a year job with two service industry uh, companies with no benefits. That's the difference. The Iron Range in the state of Minnesota won the Second World War. It helped build the major cities across the United States, and it can, again, have a big economic boom if we let it. Thank you. Okay, let's, um, let's go to the next question. I got uh, another lightning round. Uh, this will be on the sales tax. And actually, it picks up on uh, this notion of what's the extent of local control in Minnesota. This uh, person wants to know, varied sales the, the sales tax rate varies across Minnesota and has, and has created a bookkeeping nightmare for small businesses. How can you fix the sales tax? 
Should we go to a uniform rate statewide, or should we allow more local control? And um, uh, Mayor, I think we start with you. 30 seconds. We start with the mayor that has no local sales tax in her community. And what, I, what I've learned as I've studied this issue is, it's political. So if you're an insider and your elected official's been in for a long time and you can get it passed, you're gonna get a local sales tax. And so if you look at it, that's exactly what it is. It's disparate throughout the entire state. Some communities have it, some communities don't. Some are higher, some are lower. So there's no uniformity in there. There's no consistency, there's no certainty for businesses. I would not uh, like to support a statewide sales tax. But what I can tell you about local sales taxes, if they want to raise them based on uh, over what is already there, they should always have to have a referendum. No exceptions for stadiums, as we've seen lately, or a few other things, if you happen to be in the right political place, uh, I think it should be, if you want local control, have it let the people actually have a say. Well, there already is a legislative process in place if you want that local option sales tax, and it absolutely does include a referendum as a requirement, unless, of course, the idiots in St. Paul decide to waive the referendum. Uh, I believe local control, if they want to do that, they certainly have the ability to do it, and you get to vote. And if your city doesn't want to do it, then you can vote no. So uh, there's a process in place, uh, like I said before, I want to raise the sales tax and so all the way down to 5%, uh, and uh, start from there. But uh, we already have that process in place, and it's a good process as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think the common thread here is due process. Which is if people have due process and are informed and can make good decisions, and they can both know about something that's the creates disparity across the state, they'll do that. So. Let's make sure that people are informed. Let's make sure there's a due process. The people who usually get hurt with this the most are the middle class. And middle class in large cities, by and large, are the ones that get hit the hardest. And once again, we have to have, as Republican <coughs> candidates, we need to spread that message across the state of Minnesota that the middle class needs to have responsible governance from the top down. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to keep getting it at the local level instead of the top level. We can make that argument. We can win that argument statewide, and it's based on prosperity. I like that message, and I'm going to take that message into Minneapolis. Keith, okay, yeah. Uh, Boy, coming at the end of the lightning round is tough. <laughs> but I agree. Uh, the process works. It favors local, local control. There's a referendum uh, component attached to it. And again, if the state comes in and mandates what every local unit of government can and can't do uh, in this and every other area, guess what? Local government doesn't matter anymore. And they are the most accountable and the most local to you, the voters. I will say, from the statewide perspective, while we are high on taxes and everything, where we really stand out, is in the estate tax and the corporate tax and the income tax, the statewide commercial and industrial property tax that no other state has. That's what we should tackle first. Okay, thank you very much. We have now come to our last question. Again, it's gonna be the lightning round. We're gonna start with Mr. Johnson. So here's the question. Why specifically are you the strongest candidate on economic and business issues to win in November? Commissioner Johnson. I would say look at our backgrounds, what we have done rather than what we tell you we're going to do. And if you look both at my legislative background, I think in actually getting conservative, free market legislation passed, not just offering it, nobody's record compares to mine. And then also look at our professional backgrounds. I have spent more than half of my adult life in the private sector, both working for others and working for myself, along with uh, serving in both state and local government. I think it's the most balanced approach that you're gonna find on this stage. I think I'm the most qualified because I am a fighter for the values that this party represents. It's the party platform. That party platform is economic freedom, business incentives, providing Minnesota with the engine to make our lives better. I'm also very electable. I've actually won multiple elections, including a very strong, a very close election in my primary. So I think I'm the most electable because I bring a fighter's mentality and a very plain spoken directness to government. And you know what? Conservative Democrats and independents really do that and really want my that. I'm not a politician and I'm a really good investigator. And I'm completely in line with President Trump notions and direction with regards to making sure we bring uh, resources and, and wealth back to the United States. The same is true within the state of Minnesota. 
the top tier of wealth have left Minnesota. We need to get those people back. We need to make Minnesota competitive, and we need to make sure that you have the ability to prosper. Thank you, Kathy. A few years ago, a lady in Hugo named Katie said to me, you know, the problem is this. The Republicans keep taking the state back from the Democrats, and the Democrats keep taking back from the Republicans, and we never get it. Katie speaks for we the people. She's the person that Donald Trump was the only person listening to. We need to talk to Katie, and we need to talk to people like her across the state of Minnesota. I built buildings, that was my, my business. You gotta get a whole bunch of people who don't agree with each other to build something on a specific date for a specific time. That's what I wanna do across the state. Thank you very much, my name is Matt Dean. Well, everyone talks about it and they say they have results, but you look at the state budget and it's grown 50% in the last eight years. You look at the Hennepin County budget, it's grown 53% uh, in the last eight years. Uh, I'm the only person up here who's ever cut a budget and reduced that. 50% redu reduction in operating costs, 63% in our debt at the state party. I was a reformer in the legislature. I stood up to the special interests. I have a passion for returning the power in the state to the people of Minnesota and reinvigorating a belief in the people of Minnesota with a track record that proves that we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. I have the proven results in Woodbury. We have made Woodbury a pro-business friendly environment. We can take that to the state of Minnesota. We have increased jobs by 17%. We have, we have added new businesses. We have set our levy so that we are not growing faster than the rate of population inflation, unlike the Minnesota that is spending tremendously faster than the rate of growth in the state. The success of Woodbury is proof, so I'd like to take that to the state of Minnesota and make the entire state of Minnesota prosperous. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of our discussion. Please join me in thanking the candidates. with our DFL candidates for government. This election in 2008 is a good one. So we're going to tell these folks and the other candidates is really an all of our members. So thank you very much and have a great day.